Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished guests, comrades and friends, today all of us do, by our presence here and by our celebrations in other parts of our country and the world, confer glory and hope to newborn liberty. Out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long, Mathibona society, of which all humanity will be proud. Our daily deeds as ordinary South Africans must produce an actual South African reality that will reinforce humanity's belief in justice, strengthen its confidence in the nobility of the human soul, and sustain all our hopes for a closeless life for all. All this we owe both to ourselves and to the peoples of the world who are so well represented here today. To my compatriots, to my compatriots, I have no hesitation in saying that each one of us is as intimately attached to the soil of this beautiful country as are the famous jacaranda trees of Pretoria and the mimosa trees of the Bushveld. Each time one of us touches the soil of this land, we feel a sense of personal renewal the national mood changes as the seasons change. We are moved by a sense of joy and exhilaration when the grass turns green and the flowers bloom. That spiritual and physical oneness we all share with this common homeland explains that the depth of the pain we all carried in our hearts as we saw our country tear itself apart in terrible conflict. And as we saw it spend, outlawed and isolated by the peoples of the world, precisely because it had become the universal base of the pernicious ideology and practice of racism and racial oppression. We, the people of South Africa, feel fulfilled that you know, humanity has taken us back into its bosom, that we, who were outlaws not so long ago, have today be given the rare privilege to be host to the nations of the world on our own soil. It's the Michael Brooks Show. My name is Michael Brooks. We are broadcasting live from Brooklyn, USA, where left is best as it is everywhere else with Super Producer Matt Black. You. 
chief economist David Griscom. How's it going? Super producer David Slavic, offsite, roaming the digitosphere, Twitter, the Discord, everywhere else, and the growing, ever expanding, ever aggressive TMBS universe. On this week's program, Mersa Baradaran. Not bad. She is the author of The Color of Money. She's a professor of law at the University of Georgia. We are talking about the foundations of wealth disparity in this country, the history of racial discrimination and financial distribution, and the overlapping hierarchies that have created the distinct pathologies of American capitalism. And then a very, frankly, lightweight but embraced by the intellectual dark web, a group of men who have once again taken their self-proclaimed name after a part of the web where you, you know, I don't know, buy like stolen organs and child porn. Yeah, that group. They've attempted uh, to promote the work of an article that challenged her work. We'll respond to that and touch on the federal jobs guarantee. Plus, Megan McCain, who has she ever... Like when you watch Meghan McCain, you realize we really do need gulags. We'll get to that in the gulag segment. In the shout out, there's some very good people running for Congress. Of course, we know about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but there's candidates from Massachusetts to Hawaii running for real left campaigns, Medicare for all, abolish ICE, and deal with the overarching themes of inequality, U.S. militarism, and all of the areas of true crisis and opportunity that we face today. Register, get out and vote. It's coming. All that and more on this week's Michael Brooks Show. But first, let's turn our attention to what happened in Israel just a couple of days ago. Many of us have said for quite some time, if we're talking in a purely functional, legal, ethical, and moral sense, Israel is an apartheid state with regards to the occupation of the West Bank, which very closely mirrors what we saw in South Africa, the occupation, uh, the siege on Gaza, which is actually a very different thing, and in some respects, uh, uh, more autonomous than what you would see in apartheid, and then also far worse, because it's literally a ring of presence that does not allow uh, people in Gaza to function in any way outside of the open-air prison that Israel uh, has control over, and of course is governed in absolutely a repressive and abusive way by Hamas. This legislation that was passed last week and deals with Israel within 67 borders, where Israeli politicians could make the case in some limited respects that in 67 borders, Israel was a sort of preferential democracy, but still a democracy. Well, this law, statehood law, has come into place, and that throws that into profound doubt. We're going to set the table this is a piece, uh, a report from Al Jazeera that goes over the reaction to the bill from Arab and Palestinian lawmakers and some of what's actually in this legislation. As Israel's capital, Stefani Decker has more from West Jerusalem. It's official. Israel is a state exclusively for Jews. That's the essence of the controversial nation-state bill passed by the Knesset on Thursday. After hours of heated debate, the measure became law by a vote of 62 to 55, with two abstentions. For years, the language of the bill divided political opinion between the ruling parties and the opposition. Arab members of the Knesset say the law legalizes discrimination. This is a bill from a government that is an enemy to Palestinians. It's the most dangerous measure. It's a law from a racist government against Palestinian rights, and it creates an apartheid regime. It turns Israel into a fascist state. The most controversial clause in the bill, a provision calling for Jewish-only communities, was replaced at the last minute. The original legislation would have allowed the state to establish separate communities on the basis of religion and nationality. The replacement provision says, the state sees developing Jewish settlement as a national interest and will take steps to encourage, advance and implement this interest. 
And of course, Israeli's far-right government, Israel's far-right government, is made up of a coalition which includes parties that support settlers in the West Bank and parties explicitly dedicated to the West Bank settler, settler colonial project. And as we know, and as I touched on before, Israel was already an apartheid state in a very broad sense of the term because of the 67 borders this, uh, and occupation uh, that has been ongoing since the 67 war. This is the legal definition of apartheid. A deliberate and systemic act of racial discrimination with the purpose of maintaining unlawful structures of domination by one race over another. We see this in everywhere from separate bus lines IDF soldiers backing settlers uh, in violence against Palestinian civilians. We see this in the reality that Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank are not autonomous actors and are controlled by an outside force who, in the case of West Bank, restricts their movements and freedom behind an iron cage and security wall, and in Gaza, blocks them from food, medicine, participation in a global economy, and regularly kills civilians in Gaza in a reckless and wanton fashion, uh, which we see on a regular basis. So that is the reality of Israel. And it's also a reality now that in its sort of very painful and striking variant is really giving the sort of final death throes of a liberal Zionist perspective. And I'm agnostic about this in the sense that was there a historical injustice in the founding of the state of Israel going back to the 1940s, which as a matter of course meant that hundreds of thousands of Palestinians lost their homes? Absolutely. It's a foundational injustice. And it's of course also a foundational reality that Jewish people fled genocide, Holocaust, and persecution from, uh, from Europe. And this was the political reality and the reality of the founding of Israel. If you had a point where there was an actual two-state solution with two full, clear, autonomous states and provisions for Palestinian refugees, including going back to an independent Palestinian state or going back to Israel, and financial compensation, other resources, that might have been the workable political solution. And that, by the way, was never fully put on the table, not by Ehud Barak, whose proposal would have only been about 95 percent of occupied territories and would still not allow for an autonomous Palestinian state in terms of doing things like controlling its own airspace. Ehud, Barak, Ehud Olmert came a lot closer, um, but still some of the same problems remained. And of course, even as he was doing that, he was implementing uh, on the verge of implementing cast lead, which was a major humanitarian series of crimes against Palestinians in Gaza. So we're at a point today where regardless of where you come from with it, if you value equality, fraternity, anti-religious supremacy of any, co of any sort, and you do not believe in identitarian politics at the expense of the human rights for all, you need to be in the struggle for a nonviolent, fully democratized resolution to this process. Not only is the world turning in the opposite direction, in fact, we could see that Israel's unapologetic racialized ethno state was actually not just the sort of exceptional case which the United States supported in all conditions and the Europeans had an ambivalent but supportive relationship to, in some cases because of their obvious hideous history towards the Jewish people, specifically in Germany's case, obviously, but in many other European cases. We can actually see now that the far-right ethno-nationalist fusion of hyper-capital and white identity politics in Israel, because of course this also not only applies to Palestinians, this also applies to Jewish people who might be from Ethiopia, as an example. Not this bill specifically, but other efforts to deport people and uh, moves by the Israeli right. We could see that this move this strategy was the precursor of a resurgent far-right politics in all Western countries. So that the fascist heirs of the same people that persecuted the Jewish people in France and Germany and elsewhere, that are now running rampant over Europe, but this time on a program of Muslim bigotry, they reached out to Israel quite some time ago because they saw an analogy there. And it's the same reason that the ever-punchable Richard Spencer endorsed this legislation. And it's also the same reason why you'll see 
some of the worst people on earth showing up in your YouTube feed trying to lie about the legacy of the liberation struggle of South Africa, which is something that we're going to have to be covering much more extensively and will be on this show. But if you care about real values, you care about dignity, justice, and freedom from violence for all, then you have to be supportive of a clear, just, and equitable solution for all in Israel-Palestine. And Nelson Mandela is in our camp on this, and here he is at a town hall that he did with Ted Koppel in Harlem just in his first tour of the United States before becoming president of a democratic South Africa and after being released from being imprisoned by the apartheid regime for several decades. As far as Yasser Arafat is concerned, I explained to Mr. Sidney that we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. And part of that new project is we're actually inaugurating a new uh, series on our recently launched independent YouTube channel, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes in the pitch. But uh, in YouTube fashion, we're coming up with a series of called, it's like with titles like 30 times that Mandela owned Israel or this Zionist idiot asked Mandela a question and then got crushed. <laughs> That's what, yeah, yeah. there was a huge market for VHSs in the 80s for Mandela, like, or the 70s, uh, 90s, sorry. Yeah, it was the 80s. So I was like, wow. So he was like, he was owning Zionists via video conference from prison. That's pretty impressive. It's like real, real loosening in the apartheid regime there. They were like, I don't, we're not going to let Mandela out of jail, but if he wants to crush Zionists in YouTube compilations, he can do that. <laughs> I don't see what difference it's going to make. See, you know, those videos would be awesome. We, could we get, what, 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 did, what, I don't watch those videos actually, but do they like bed music underneath like 50 times like Ben Do you want Shapiro? me to find one? Uh, I guess so. Ugh. I usually wait to have my stomach turned until the post game with this kind of stuff. But I'm just curious, like, like actually, you know, we don't even need one. For our purposes, let's suggest that these videos have some type of bedded music under them, maybe like the instrumental to something like Eye of the Tiger or something. Like something like that. I feel like that's very fitting for like, you know, the 52 times that Ben Shapiro told a student that transgenderism wasn't real or whatever the fuck these nonsense videos are on youtube i just got distracted by some of the titles um <laughs> i'll I'm put sure, them up i'm here. sure you did um, but we need some vetted music okay. in a second okay wait uh jordan peterson class with feminist host and heated interview on gender equities epic jordan peterson mops the floor mops with bbc's floor. feminist <laughs> <laughs> okay uh let's all see. right let's see if we can get like a epic Mandela, f <laughs> Mandela mops the floor with snowflake Zionist student. <laughs> uh, hi, um, uh, this is, my name is uh, Zev, and uh, I have a question uh, for Mr. Mandela about uh, uh, Israel. Oh, I see. The snowflakes are out this evening. Uh, do you con uh, condemn... Uh, um, uh, 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 Hamas uh, terrorism because it is very hurtful for us when you don't. Well, first of all, you must ask yourself, what is terrorism? Terrorism is defined... What if you like Mandela started talking like speeding up like Shapiro? Like apartheid is a specific legal metric which means discrimination and systemic ban out of people based on their race, racial characteristics. So that applies both to South Africa and Israel. Sorry, facts don't care about your feelings. Crushed. Destroyed. Destroyed. Mandela destroys Zionist. <laughs> Wait, that's more like the that right wing. That was cheap Mandela. trick. That doesn't really work. That's right. That's right wing Mandela music. That's right wing Mandela music. All right, let's go to the shout out, gentlemen. Shall we? And let's play it all the way and through. And we're back. back. Who says Ooh, Danner, 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 Danner. I don't want to get greedy, but if Danarchy could give us a shout-out beat, that would be ill. 
top of the line professionalism. Let's get to uh, the shout out. Shout out, shout out. Creepy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. <laughs> Weird. I think that's creepy. It, 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 it's incredible. <laughs> shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is crazy. <laughs> shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. <laughs> this is out of control. Shout out, shout out. That's creepy. Shout out, shout out. That's Talk about it, David. <laughs> David really grooves out to that song. Dude, I'm a sucker for those beats. <laughs> Danarchy brings fire. Um, and by the way, somebody asked me, like, the point really is, is that whatever we're shouting out, probably Alex Jones would be really unsettled by. So we're both paying homage sure. to him as a broadcasting talent. We're also saying, like, the thing that we're about to praise Alex Jones would be like, you know, this is part of a globalist cabal, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to talk about it. Uh, we'll, we'll start with her, and there's a couple of candidates. I just want to mention, I mean, look, there is absolutely no contradiction between the urgent and essential need for mass organizing. Uh, we're talking about everything from teacher strikes. I'm really interested in tenant uh, rent strikes campaigns. Joshua Kahn, who for patrons, we've initiated a new series of Patreon content on the specifics and the how-tos of organizing. He's worked everywhere from transgender rights in Colombia to the climate crisis in the Philippines to combating Joe Arpaio, whose white supremacist policies with regards to immigration in Arizona, and really that, along with people like Jesse Helms' Southern, uh, strat Southern politics, were really the foundations of the modern Republican Party. All of that is true and indispensable, and it's also absolutely essential that Democrats take back Congress, ideally the Senate, and you really need to make sure that you at the very least are registered and voting and participating in the process. There's no sort of like tool cool position for that. And I do also wanna highlight the fact that there are some actually very worthwhile and good people running for Congress. Obviously we know about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we're gonna need to stay very vigilant on that campaign because Joe Crowley's doing his little sneaky shit by staying on the uh, working families line, I believe it is. So we're going to have to keep monitoring that and let's make sure her general election margin over him is even bigger than the primary. Uh, and also, uh, this isn't an idea. It's just a thought. Maybe somebody will snatch his board to run Qatar. Just a thought. Uh, but there's other people running. And I, 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 this, this actually really stuck out for me. Uh, E.O. Higgins, who's a, a good journalist that I know a lot of people uh, follow, is uh, based out not too far from where I grew up in Massachusetts. And he wrote a profile in The Intercept for a candidate named Tirira Amatul Wadud, who is running in Massachusetts's first district. This, this is the area that I grew up in, in rural Western Massachusetts. It's not, uh, the district has been broken up basically. So even though I grew up in these towns, it's actually a different district than the one I grew up in. And she is taking on a guy named Richie Neal, who is the dean of the Massachusetts delegation and the sort of perfect hybrid of like machine politics with corporate donations uh, in the Crowley mode, although with far less charm, to be honest. She's an African-American Muslim attorney. She works in civil rights and immigration cases. And among other things, including actually some very local and important issues for the economy of an area like so many other rural areas that's really fallen behind, she's running on a campaign of Medicare for all. Um, and a broad, serious civil rights campaign. And we have her link up to her website. Uh, she might be on the show, but I'd like people to check her out. Tarira Amatul Wadud, she is a great candidate. And the piece is, can this progressive woman of color pull off an Ocasio-Cortez style upset in Massachusetts? Um, Kalana, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna butcher it, so I'm gonna look it up. Uh, Kaniela uh, Ng is a candidate that I just recorded an interview with and it's gonna be released for everybody. We're releasing it publicly as a bonus for e a TMBS bonus for everybody on our new YouTube channel and of course on Patreon and on iTunes. He's a member of Democratic Socialists for America. He was a leader in clawing back and protecting people's uh, homes from uh, Mark Zuckerberg's attempt to evict native Hawaiians from their houses and build a uh, apocalypse bunker for himself in Hawaii. He's running a campaign on 
social housing option, in addition to Medicare for All, a federal jobs guarantee, and a clear vision for peace and declining militarism in the world. He's a Justice Democrats and DSA candidate, great candidate in Hawaii. If you, uh, if you hate Mark Zuckerberg and thought maybe one way you would exercise uh, that is deleting your Facebook, a much more substantial thing you could do would be to donate to his campaign and make him a political player on that, on those mm-hmm. islands. Indeed, and use your Facebook account to effortlessly plug for his campaign and look forward to that interview. Um, there's other people running. And there's people, obviously, we've had Julia Salazar on twice. He's not running in this current uh, cycle, but Jabari Brisport ran a great campaign for city council here. This is part of the process. And obviously, I would advocate that at the end of the sort of day, you have to go for getting um, a better candidate, uh, you know, into office. Uh, period. And there is just an eff- uh, an aspect of this, which is Republicans need to not have another two years of un- uninterrupted control of, of government, period. And there is uh, a real vibrant process happening right now uh, that isn't an abstracted debate. It's literally a test. We have great people running for real positions Uh, And there's momentum and there's possibility. So you can help all of these candidates and you can also look up on your local state and federal level what's going on. And that was the shout out for today. Make sure you're registered. Make sure you're doing it. Um, It's really, really important. Okay, let's get to something else that is incredibly important, which is obviously why uh, Matt has not selected a beat yet. What? The sh- we're doing the pitch, and then we're going to go to Mersa. The Gulag and the Griscom Economic Minute are going to happen later. It's all right. Don't worry about it, man. It's not like we're live. <clears throat> it's fine. Oh, this is not a good pitch music. I, you know, I like things that are a little more heroic, a little bit more... Well, that's the truth. You can literally always satisfy me with Dipset. Dude. This got me through some really brutal shit that I was doing in the gym the other day. Because this song makes you feel like killing somebody. It's beautiful. Well, I, it like, literally sounds like... I know it might be the sample of right. that a horror stab theme song. Right. I can't remember what it is. I don't know. You would know that better than me, I think. But I, yeah, there's a... There's a beautiful calibrated hostility and adrenaline to it. And I hope that people are listening to this while they fan out across Hawaii's first district and get Mark Zuckerberg's arch nemesis into Congress. This is a conversation uh, that we put together which spans the globe. We have significant coverage, obviously, of Africa, Latin America. We're going to be expanding Congress into the Middle East, Iran. We're going to be expanding on China uh, as well. We have patrons and listeners and viewers in Europe, in Brazil, uh, in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, and, of course, across the United States, a conversation that can bridge the sort of accessible organizing tactics of radical activism of a serious veteran and innovator in the climate justice movement along with getting you inside the pulse of great candidates for public office plus some of the most important journalists scholars academics activists uh, that you can imagine in terms of understanding all of the issues uh, that we face but not just the issues the opportunities we have to address all of these problems fundamentally and reorient our society we're doing it here and we're incredibly proud of it and we rely on you to grow it and sustain it 2000 patrons is our next goal we're well on our way to that we're a little under 500 a way to go now it's time to do it. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Patreon.com slash TMBS. We have our own YouTube channel now as well, which already has several clips uh, up on it. Uh, and we're going to be tweeting that out. It doesn't have a specific URL yet. Yeah, we need to get to a certain number of subscribers and watch hours before they give us that. But uh, it has the full post game for with the Taibi Yeah, we last unlocked week. the Taibi post game. You can check that out. And also a lot smaller uh, digestible clips. So as a lot of people have been approaching me about how to promote the show, and obviously, I mean, of course, I want people to watch and listen to everything. Uh, but obviously, when you're sort of getting to, you know, letting people know about it, it's helpful to have these shorter, my, more digestible clips 
And that's what we're doing there, including also a lot of uh, clips dealing with this intellectual dark web nonsense, which is also going to correlate, uh, in fact, with the book that I'm writing for Zero Books um, on this uh, basically public intellectual catastrophe as well. Uh, we uh, had a massive spike up in iTunes reviews because a lot of people wanted to join the bandwagon of praising this show for treating Elon Musk unfairly. And if you would like to add your two cents to that, please do. Um, and because that continues to get us uh, more listeners and eyeballs. So patreon.com slash TMBS. We appreciate all of you. We will be right back with Mersa Baradaran on the Michael Brooks Show. back to the michael brooks show i'm michael brooks david do not smirk at me over a cameron instrumental when i am fighting for my life here in terms of a pronunciation okay i had matt saibi was here last week who i really have been probably reading for like 15 years and obviously i wanted to make a good impression on the guy but i wasn't nervous at all this makes me nervous and it's going to happen right now we have a Guest whose work I admire immensely, who is going to be uh, appearing from time to time on this show. I'm very happy to say Mersa Bararadaran. She is the author of The Color of Money, and she's a professor of law at the University of Georgia. Mersa, how did I do? Very good. You nailed it. Great job. Beautiful. Thank you. There really should have been yep. some type of like gladiator sound effect for me when I did that. Um, maybe like an are you not entertained yeah. uh, <laughs> will you yeah. remind us we're going we're gonna to get to a, a, a piece in the kind of broader sort of intellectual culture or lack of intellectual culture around dealing with the themes that you work on frankly but can you just kind of we touched on this when you were on several weeks ago uh, but we were very specifically focused on uh, postal banking and the sort of systems of economic disenfranchisement that lower income people across the board face. In your book, Color of Money, you really get into the specific steps um, that of course overlap across the board, class, race, gender, and so on. But you focus specifically on the, the racial dimension of the history of this country uh, uh, you know, from obviously slavery, but also Jim Crow, and then through uh, various policy mechanisms to keep wealth out of black hands, essentially. Can you kind of tell that story to us? Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think uh, it, it all starts it, with uh, Reconstruction and the Civil War. And, and you know, I think the, the, the U.S. Uh, economy, you know, was yeah, obviously there's a there's whole new capitalism debate about whether slavery was profitable or not. And, and, and what's interesting about this question is, for a while, the history was that 
look, slavery was this backwards institution that capitalism was going to wipe out anyway. And, you know, therefore, it, it wasn't like the plantation economy was was this um, not profitable. Yes, it was horrendous. But but the, the question of profitability ability has been core in this debate. And and there's this new um, literature out there that's really examining this and, and saying, no, actually, slavery was quite efficient and quite profitable. And, and why does this question matter now? Right. And, and it matters because. If slavery, if slavery was backward and unprofitable, then it has nothing to do with capitalism. If slavery was incredibly profitable and efficient, this is the end result of capitalism, right? And so, so, so what does capitalism end up with? Um, you know, I think the, a libertarian would say, well, capitalism ends up with freedom for everyone. And I think someone else might say, well, actually, capitalism, capitalism might end up with those with capital using that capital to enslave other human beings, uh, because that is uh, really um, profitable if you don't have to pay for labor. <laughs> you know? right. And so nice. a- after, after this breaks down uh, during the Civil War, um, there's this quick you know, um, scramble to get black uh, labor back into growing cotton. Um, and the idea was if they got land like the free slaves got in Haiti, then there's no way that they would grow cotton. Um, they would grow subsistence crops because that's what the Haitian slaves had done. Um, because if you have a, a tract of your own land, you're going to feed your family first. And cotton is a debt crop. So you're going to maybe plant a little bit of cotton, but not so much. And so because we had to make them have cotton because, you know, New York and Liverpool and the whole country is relying on that cotton, it was really important not to get land. Now, why did I go into this story? Because this plays out over and over again. Is When you have this pivotal moment, like Reconstruction was, where Um, Black Americans are about to get full-fledged freedom. And everyone, every leader, Frederick Douglass, um, Sherman, you know, Lincoln, was convinced that without land, you actually don't have freedom because you can't participate freely um, if you're going to be just labor. And indeed, that's what happened, right? You've got emancipation, but then a quick re-enslavement into, you know, um, uh, sharecropping and and debt. And so, so, so I think there has been this um, consistent through history, um, you know, reliance on our, our economy becoming uh, racialized and, and, and needing black as, uh, blacks as labor. And when that sort of cotton economy breaks down um, and you have the great migration, I, I track this um, historically in the book and you've got, you know, black migrants coming up north. Um, there's this segregation that happens, and, and that is sort of where the industrial economy, um, you know, builds on on the backs of black labor. Again, um, it's less crucial, right? They're, the in, industrial firms are happy to take immigrants of all sorts, but the segregation patterns uh, remain intact. And so I, I sort of track um, banks because that's what I know, and also because banks um, reveal the the formation of capital and the and the blocks to that capital. And so what I've shown through the book in following banks and following labor and capital is that blacks, having lived in a segregated economy, and because of the Jim Crow laws, were never able to accumulate capital. And because they weren't able to accumulate capital, they were ne- never able to fully participate in the voting process and, and to, to secure their freedom through the vote. Um, so we, which is why you have the 15th Amendment. And then we have the Civil Rights era, which is like, okay, we really meant that, <laughs> right? right. Um, with the Voting Rights Act. Um, but it didn't have to happen that way. It could have been that they just had the vote. Um, and then the New Deal, you know, uh, I think by by the time that, you know, 1934, like blacks are kind of voting in these machines, but the New Deal also um, creates, you know, wealth for uh, the white middle class. And that's a misnomer. I think people say, oh, well, the white middle class got mortgages through the New Deal. And I sort of describe it differently. These, the New Deal creates a white middle class. Before right. that, you have white blue collar workers in the industrial north. And all of a sudden, it's cheaper to own your own home and have a mortgage and live in this beautiful suburb full of white people instead of paying rent in some you know, squalid city, um, except for blacks were specifically excluded from all of these New Deal provisions just because of their race. It wasn't a credit uh, function and and that is something that is still in effect. In other words, no, the racial zoning isn't in effect, but those red lines that were created in the New Deal still determine the type of schools that are in the neighborhood, the racial makeup of the neighborhood, and the ability to get the, the, a certain kind of loans. Right. So you look at where are payday lenders, 
where are subprime loans being um, targeted, et cetera. And it's all in those uh, redlined areas. And so I, sh- I showed that sort of disparate economy that forms because of those policy decisions. Right. And also to me, like I always think of I like that Marx's idea of that primitive accumulation, like these sort of like instead of markets, they don't just sort of magically arise. There is always a kind of time when you, you know, you take a commons and you turn it into a private asset or something like that. And when Mm -hmm. I was reading you, I mean, I kind of thought it's not a direct comparison, but there was this way it was just like we have a slave labor force, which is going to build all this on the house. And then there's mm-hmm. going to be all of these different mechanisms where we're going to sort of perpetuate that underclass experience. And obviously, we're going to build all of these, you know, cultural justifications around that. But the root of it is economic. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and, yeah. and in light of that, it's like, wh- how could there even be like this notion that it wouldn't be efficient strikes me as something that like. You know, any six year old would understand like, yes, if I (laughs) pay you nothing and you build a whole economy for me, that's a win. Right. (laughs) Right. 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 Well, well, I mean, um, I mean, we'll we'll talk about the Quillette piece, but one of the things is like, well, slavery wasn't profitable because look at, you know, some of the the, there there were poor people in the South. But but that I mean, that doesn't capture what slavery was. Slavery was a cotton producing and a tobacco producing endeavor and where do those profits go always to the capitalists right. are they all in the south absolutely not i mean the plantation owners are in the south and they get plenty of profits but there's new york traders there's liverpool traders there are literally like slave back securities being traded um through the banks and so that's a lot of money that is not captured on that plantation it is it built the economy of the north and uh in great britain and so so really, I mean, those are profits that don't go away during the Civil War. I mean, some of the plantation money does, you know, um, but 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 those econ- th- those riches uh, built on the backs of slaves remain and and make a lot of people rich. We'll get to the Quillet piece in a minute, but I just want I want to note one thing and then ask you a question about the present day. I mean, and also in addition to that, the other thing that that. <laughs> And we will elaborate on this. That just always strikes me when when examples like that are used, like, oh, well, the South wasn't uniformly wealthy. It's like, Mm -hmm. well, first, Mm -hmm. there's the bigger economic reality, which you just elegantly explained. And, you know, I guess does take some digging. But honestly, if you're going to write a piece like this, you should be familiar with that. And then the second point being that there's I mean, of course, right. Most industries that create vast riches are not you know, certainly without government intervention, they're not going to be filtered into the hands of, you know, the average non land owning or even small time land owning, you know, white southerner. So, right. Of course, they're not right. going to be particularly right. benefited yeah. by this. I mean, that seems kind of obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And you said something really important earlier, like the, you know, the legal mechanisms of, of how this was uh, in place, right? The, the idea that you know, uh, this just kind of organically happened is another myth. I think, you know, there was very specific um, legal and state um, apparatuses that were created um, both during and after slavery. I mean, I teach contract law um, to one else, and most of the contract jurisprudence that was developed in England was about enforcing cotton trades, right? What do you do, you know, with this cotton? And and even the, you know, the, the, the slave bodies, right? There was these balance sheets that the, that the, uh, the, the plantations had, and how do you treat, you know, a suicide and a death, or how do you, you know, commoditize these things, these, these, built, these institutions um, built around them. And then, of course, post-slavery, there is, um, you know, the, the Southern lawyers and, and, and judges were very busy building these black codes, uh, uh, quote-unquote freedom codes, which is, this, you know, double speak, but, uh, you know, all the ways in which you could punish um, black laborers uh, from from if if they decided not to grow cotton, right? So um, right. so the law and the state was very much invested in this, um, and and of course it was, you know, um, this idea that the that the state, you know, has the, 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 there's ever a time where we had this like lazy fair economy. Uh, no, that that just didn't happen. And then the giving away of land. I mean, the Homestead Act, um, giving back the land to the Southerners. You know, um, if it was capitalism, you would give it back to those who. Um, reap, you know, sow the land for years, which is the, the slaves, and, and they, they didn't get any of it. It just went back to their masters. In the present day, 
you talked about, you know, obviously these things are not uh, legal anymore, although I, I wonder, I mean, you know, obviously you have maybe this answers some of my own question. If you have courts um, that are sort of specifically forbidding people from enforcing those laws and letting states claw those back specifically, I'm now I'm obviously thinking more of things like voting rights, but I would imagine that it would certainly apply to issues like housing discrimination. How do these things stay in practice uh, informally without the legal mechanism? Like, how do they still work today, even though now, like in the last couple of decades, now it's like, okay, this stuff is sort of, it's not in the books anymore. It's quote unquote, you know, it's officially disapproved of, but it still acts out in our day to day lives. How does it happen? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the, this is the tricky part where people like, you know, you peel one layer of the onion and you're like, oh, I know a lot. You know, this is, all, all, you know, that the, the people who, 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 who say, oh, okay, racism ended and, and therefore it's, it's over and, and, and the Civil Rights Act now don't permit these laws. And, and, I, and, and a couple of things. One is obviously that some of the laws still remain. Um, and, and this is like, the, you know, the, the, the heavy arm of the criminal justice system and, right. and, you know, school zoning and school segregation, these ways in which, you know, we've got um, not just de facto, but de jure, like laws that retain that white advantage and, and, and uh, reinforce that black disadvantage. But beyond that, what I try to show is that you actually don't even need the laws anymore, because once you set up two different economies um, that, that work geographically because of segregation, right? So once you have white home-owning suburbs, right, and a tax base that feeds into those white home-owning suburban schools versus black ghettos of tenants who were, you know, explicitly not given those loans and the schools that fund that, right? Once you have that different economy, um, those things tend to self-propagate without any further reinforcement. Now, I do want to say we do further reinforce it, <laughs> yeah. but we've never, um, we've never dismantled it actively. Um, we've never said, okay, look at this crazy thing that we did. Let's like reverse that, right? And this was um, the Nixon pivot, right? So, you know, post-civil rights era, there's a lot of like, okay, now that we have the civil rights era laws, which were actually just deregulation, right? These were, yeah. these were rights that people should have had in the first place. These were not new rights, like the right to vote, the right not to be submitted to Jim Crow. These were not new rights, right? Once those are passed, then every principle in the civil rights movement is like, okay, now let's get to the real stuff, which is economic justice. So that could include integration, or reparations, either one, and that's when it gets shut down. Right. That's when you get the white backlash, and that's when you get the Nixon Southern strategy, and you get you know law and order. And so we we never completed that um, civil rights movement, which the, the the most important part, which was okay. Now that we're here, I mean, President Johnson said like you can't like take a guy who's been chained for 300 years and while, you know, the other race has been running this race and say, okay, now catch up by yourself, right? You've got to do something. And, um, you know, but he obviously gets uh, trapped in, in Vietnam and loses his credibility and, and Nixon understands that he cannot move forward at all with civil rights. And this is one of the stories that I was really actually surprised by as I was doing this research is how, um, how much that, neoliberal economic thinking that is that it, it, it arises during the late 60s and 70s and obviously gained steam during the Reagan era um, started as a rebuttal to civil rights. So, you know, Alan Greenspan writing Richard Nixon and saying, do not even entertain integration or reparations because that's anti-capitalist. Milton Friedman in Capitalism and Freedom saying civil rights laws are anti-capitalist. Um, you know, because because racism is inefficient. And so obviously racism will just go away on its own. Well, it doesn't because racism actually is profitable. It's quite efficient. Right. Well, that was the, right. the kind of amazing pivot that these people it's like they 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 started in the late 60s and they said, OK, if you throw out all of human and po or at least all of American and policy history and you substitute it for my fantasy life. I think you'll find a right. pretty compelling argument <laughs> yeah. that racism right, will take right. care of itself. And that actually does lead us into the Quillette piece and the intellectual dark web. But I, I do want to just kind of add to that, too. I mean, my, one of my sort of intellectual major influences, and I've had him on this show, and 
is Adolf Reed. And that's, and that's actually one of his mm-hmm. kind of main arguments about the 60s and civil rights, which he, he pivots against a lot of people, right? Like he pivots against, mm-hmm. you know, moderates and centrists, and he pits against the kind of like nationalists who have a sort of pure identity focus. And he's like, what it was really about was, I mean, and he's a, you know, he is a Marxist, so he would obviously sort of push things much more broadly, but it was like, people like A. Philip Randolph were, those were the two steps, get rid of legal separation and then say, like, there's a white social democracy and we are going to become part of that social democracy in a fully owned in way. And that never happens. And I mean, and that's the history. Yeah, especially because, I mean, this is a tail end. I mean, civil rights is the tail end of massive government subsidies um, to white Americans, right? Um, Through the GI Bill and the FHA and all of the ways in which the government was so involved in the economy and in wealth creation. And as soon as the black community is like, okay, we'll deal us in, they're like, no, we're done with all that. (laughs) You know, like go to capitalism. Yeah. 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 And then, of course, and then obviously it starts to, you know, eat itself in a way where, well, let's start with the easy target, which is playing to people's racism, and then we'll actually play it out in the way we want, which is to gut and dismantle the whole thing and create a very broad racially distributed underclass because fundamentally these people don't want, uh, you know, a a public sector. There was this piece in, in Quillette um, which I'll do my best. I mean, I've read it. I'm going to try to <laughs> summarize it in a, I'm not good at summarizing things non polemically, to be honest with you. It's called black American culture and the racial wealth gap. And it's by a guy named Coleman Hughes, who, you know, it should be noted for purposes of this, like he is an undergraduate and I mean, well, I'm not going to elaborate what I was up to in college, but I wasn't writing anything like yeah. this. So let me just give right. credit where credit is due. I was focused on, well, maybe less harmful activities because I wasn't writing trash like this. But see, I can't help myself. <laughs> but I wasn't doing something so ambitious. But he... Yeah. Um, He's also African-American to note. Yes. Which is relevant, I think, mm-hmm. when we get to the stuff that I can speak more clearly on, which is really the the obvious market opportunity that's open in this sort of intellectual dark web scene. But he's basically mm-hmm. going to say to, he, he goes after your work and ta Coates's work. And, you know, I want, maybe you can elaborate on this and I know that people will accuse <laughs> me, particularly those kind of, you know, people who, who, who float around those circles of, you know, being uncharitable and blah, blah, blah. But honestly, I mean, this piece, first of all, this is a this is a recapitul this is a restating of a very old argument. And it's the culture version instead of the genetics version. And it's mm-hmm. sort of a hodgepodge of um examples about immigration which don't make sense because he's gonna say that, you know, there's immigrant communities who come to the United States who face discrimination and whose wealth has grown significantly. So that sort of disproves uh this racism uh focus now obviously like the 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 first response is that still even though you know people have these very racialized images of immigrants most people that immigrate to this country are definitely relatively speaking um Mm -hmm. certainly have some financial and educational attainment levels so that already really complicates that claim and then there's just these other kind of things that you know to me just aren't coherent. Like, yes, Singapore was, uh, you know, colonized and then it wasn't. Uh, but that meant that like, right, they were decolonized. Nobody stayed and sort of forced them to grow cotton. Um, and then there's just these sort of broader, like, you know, then the really kind of frankly, Bill Cosby stuff about, you know, black culture. So, you know, that's what I got from it. And I don't know, maybe basically like, what's your take? What, What's your response to it? Yeah. And what kind of ecosystem do you see it fitting in? Yeah, so I have a couple of things. I mean, one, yeah. one is, you know, you know look, um, there's, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? So right. he's, you know, he's, he's sort of manipulating a whole bunch of statistics here, which is fine. And he's undergraduate. Maybe he hasn't even, like, taken statistics. And I got a lot of crap on um, Twitter for calling him an undergrad. And, and I, you know was responding to Sam Harris, who was like fawning over this guy, um, saying that like, you know, this, can you believe this guy is an undergraduate and he's 
you know, taking on these. He should have added and black. (laughs) (laughs) As a Sam Harris was being more. Right, so articulate. Yeah, Yeah, right. Um, So, 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 I mean, um, look, uh, you know, the statistics that that he proves are wrong. I mean, he's just saying, like, look, slavery, and and again, one of the points was slavery was was, uh, not profitable because the South was poor, uh, one. Uh, Two, you know, the New Deal did not have these effects um, because blacks, you know, gained uh, money after the New Deal. Well, sure. I mean, you could say, like, some of the stats for black communities went up after the New Deal, but yes, the New Deal has these deleterious effects. So, so a lot of this stuff is really slippery. Well, can I ask but you a really quick question 20, about that? I'm Not to interrupt. Yeah. Could it even be yeah. fair to say, because I'm, I'm actually kind of on a sort of, you know, uh, we need to not throw the baby out of the bathwater with FDR and the New Deal kick. Is it even fair to yeah. say that, like, even if we said, okay, America is going through a mass economic meltdown and a, and, a, and a gilded age and there's, you know, Jim Crow. And in the context right. of uh, like there was through broad based delivery, some improvement for African-Americans, which Absolutely. was real. And then, of course, because sure. of things like the Dixiecrats and because of things like it was implemented, right. it was massively disproportionately beneficial for white people. So. Then you could even say, well, sure, the New Deal benefited everybody, but it's the difference between like getting on a two speed bicycle versus getting into a BMW. And that still wouldn't contradict what you've demonstrated yeah. in your research. Right, exactly. And again, sure, there were some black families that got out of those racialized ghettos, but right. a lot that couldn't, you know? So, so, so I just think those statistics don't say nearly as much as he thinks they say. But like that apart, I mean, here's, here's the nub of the argument, right? At the end, he's like, okay, well, fine, but really this is about blacks making bad decisions and, you know, single parent homes. And like you said, Bill Cosby stuff. I mean, I'll note that like all of his citations and statistics come from Thomas Sowell, who is another one of, of these um, people. But, but, you know, at the end, he makes these claims that like, why is nobody talking about self-help and culture? Why is nobody talking about this? All of the people are talking about, um, you know, policies and, and prescriptions. And and that's where I just like laugh out loud, right? Like yes. that is all anyone has ever talked about is self help and and black culture. You know, I mean that 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 idea to me, like he he is this undergraduate, right? And this is this is why this is relevant. Like in his studies, he thinks that this idea is this like brand new thing. Like, hey guys, why don't you think about this, right? Like when I thought I discovered like feminism in college right like hey you guys guess what you know and like meanwhile there's been like three waves that i have to get caught up on um before i can say anything intelligibly and thank god there wasn't like you know uh, internet back then for me to post my thoughts on why i think you know uh feminism is the right way to blah 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 right mm-hmm. so 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 you know where he's coming from a very long and um uh, uh, loud, a uh, vocal, um, uh, you know, history of black and white focus on black self-help, right? You go back to Booker T. Washington. You can, right. you know, talk about, um, you know, uh, like every sort of, I, I want to say like, who, who isn't in this, right? Daniel Patrick Moynihan, right? In the administration, in the Johnson administration. And, and these were good liberals and, and good black leaders. And, and so that's Will you actually tell the Moynihan the argument- report really quickly? Because I think I, I thought of that, too, when I read this piece. And I was like, and I really honestly, and again, this sounds condescending, but I, I don't care. You know what? Yeah. Don't be a snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> I thought to myself, has this kid ever even heard of the Moynihan report? I know. So maybe explain yeah. the Moynihan yeah, exactly. report. I mean, that, yeah. Right. I mean, this is like the Moynihan report book report, right? right? I mean, this is exactly the Moynihan report is like, yes, we like screwed some stuff up as the government, but really there's this, you know, he calls it a tangle of pathology in black culture. And of course he was citing E. Franklin Frazier, a black scholar who had also made this claim. So this is just the oldest story in the book. Booker T. Washington says this, right? We have to work on ourselves and, and self-help, and then whites will respect us if we do this sort of thing. And and the whole central premise of my book is why this doesn't work, which makes me think that he actually didn't read my book. Right. <laughs> you know, um, because his whole argument is the argument on which my book is sort of, it, it, the argument that my book is arguing with, because this is, this is what I'm saying. Look at these black banks, right? This is black self-help and black entrepreneurialism and, and, and all the cultural ways that were, you know, pushed on blacks and, and, and look at 
how how they tried so hard to build wealth given these external circumstances, right? And and why it didn't work. And it wasn't for lack of trying and it wasn't single parent homes and all of this stuff. It was the way that capitalism works. Um, and so, you know, it's, I don't even know, like people are like, well, why don't you respond to this article? You know, I've had a bunch of people write me and I'm like, but I did. I mean, I wrote right. a whole book right. <laughs> responding right. to this because this art, this argument is not new, it is not interesting. And, and it gets back to that whole intellectual dark web. I mean, these, I, these guys who think the thing that they're saying, you know, maybe women are irrational, you know, is like the newest freaking idea ever. And I hadn't like, oh, heard that before, really? actually. I'm going like, to look into I had, that. <laughs> right. <No. laughs> right. You know, um, like this idea that like, oh, well, maybe we should study, you know, um, whether there's genetic racial differences. Well, you know what? Like, that has been the history of science, you know, and maybe yes. women just don't like to be out working, but we've heard this one before, you know? Um, so these ideas, like these ideas that are, you know, supposedly like so, you know, dangerous and breathtaking, like they're so boring. They're so boring. And this is what was this Quillette article. Like, this is so boring. <laughs> yes. It's incredible. I mean, look, I mean, it's, and you're telling me, cause I'm actually having to write a book about all of this. And yes, I could tell you <laughs> it's really boring, dreary stuff. But what's interesting, yeah. what's, I guess what's interesting to me, and I feel like your work is so illustrative of this because I think that there's kind of three dynamics, like one dynamic and where I don't sympathize with the dark web characters, but I might sympathize with somebody who's an undergraduate is I, I totally get and spend time critiquing. Uh, I think that there is a certain type of very dumbed down uh as frankly, there is in every iteration of politics, but like a certain type of I don't I don't really even know the right, right phrase for it. But it's like a, a kind of politics that doesn't deal with, as an example, economics or history or context. And it is kind of a lot of sort of generic cultural signifiers. And I could see that people they get they sort of perceive as like, OK, well, all politics is just sort of like, you know, what websites you read, what kind of culture you identify with or don't. And I wouldn't draw a false equivalency there either, because it's still better to be on the like, I oppose sexism side of that. But it's a very shallow politics with a lot of problematic assumptions across the board, in my view. So th what these guys do is they take, I think, first, there's always a market, an inbuilt prejudice that pre-exists. And then they take it and they say, see, like, you know, what you perceive of as quote unquote left is just sort of like, I don't know, it's like a, you know, it's, it's a listicle from Buzzfeed about why, oh, friends is actually problematic or something. And that's the be all and end all of their politics and they're annoying and they're right. unfun and all this. And sometimes, frankly, those people are annoying and unfun if we're being real. Right. And we have right. this big, seductive, uh, serious project for you. And then what they do is they do two things. One, as you said, they substitute, um, old uh zombie ideas uh which just are either um anywhere from kind of generic and actually non-controversial uh to like like i remember like that was sam harris's game years ago with islam it was like either yeah. uh you know i'm gonna do a thought experiment about nuking the middle east which is obscene and then when you call <laughs> me on it i'm gonna just back up basically to my position is essentially is gonna be like well, you know, Islamic terrorism is is an issue. I was like, I, I, there is yeah. literally nobody in the earth that disagrees with that, right? And but the <laughs> other third step that they do, and I'm putting a lot in here because I think it's really important, I would like you to elaborate on it, is it goes back to the thing with Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan in the, in the 1960s, yeah. which is it's, it's, it's not only ahistorical, it's, it, it is the enemy of history because it is suggesting yeah. that decontextualize stats and then in fact all of these people's thought experiments and intuitions and prejudices trump the actual research and the actual things that have been de demonstrated in any number of these areas and that's why this colette piece was just like right to the center of it because he took you on and as you said it was like you did this work like th this wasn't like a I'm, you know, like, OK, like Marissa, I agree with you, but you wrote a book where you said, you know, I kind of feel like racism is a bad thing. And this kid responded to that. You answered right. this claim. <laughs> right. 
and it's all just right. skipped. And that is, that's their move yeah. with anybody who has a substantive move against them across the board. So they're literally selling not only these reactionary ideas, but almost like the destruction of history as a discipline. Right. Yeah, I mean, it is exactly right. I mean, it is, it is the idea that I am going to look at the world today as it is. So uh, black, the black racial wealth gap, um, women, you know, uh, the earning wage gap, Middle Eastern terrorism, and explain it, not reading any history, right? Mm -hmm. Not not tracking right any of it, and just explain it as is. And so the explanation must be that blacks are lazy, uh, that women are not good at working and, and should be home, and that Islam, Islam is just violent, right? right? Um, and so, so you do a little bit of thought, like you peel one layer of an onion, and you're like, I know how things work. And and the, the, the thing about history is like, the more you dig in, the more humble you become about the ability to know anything, right? I mean, I, you truly, like, you're just, gosh, like, these people were so wrong in historically that, you know, I mean, reading President Johnson, Andrew Johnson, on the cusp of the Civil War, saying, why should we treat Blacks, like, special? Because capitalism will take care of it. And you're reading this, like, how could you possibly think that? How could you possibly think that their former masters are just going to pay them what they're worth, you know, and, and yet this was a thought. And I, I see these arguments now. And it's like you you want to explain the world today without any context. Right. And 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 any real digging or knowledge. And so to hear Sam Harris talk about Islam, he's like, well, one of his claims is like the only time Islam is reformed is when uh, the West, you know, influences it. So it's like America. And it's like he First of all, I, I doubt he could name three Islamic reformists. And I am not an Islam right. scholar, but I'm from Iran, and I could name 10 Islamic reformists um, within Islam who have been reforming Islam for generations. And didn't Two, do podcasts right. with Sam Harris. Like, right. we would have to stipulate exactly. he, he doesn't personally right. do, like, you know, right. silly book tours with them, but like actual people working in context. I, I think, though, that that right. is what's so. That's what starts to catch me. Like, I, you know, I have my particular like it. It annoys me. And this type of this scene is totally overrepresented in the media spaces I'm in. But I think the long tail real threat is we already have such a kind of policy illiteracy and a historical, you know, just, just total lack of awareness. And by the way, even, you know, I know people who come to, you know, radically different political conclusions that I come to and I, you know, but they still have a sense. It's not, I guess my point being is it's, you could even expand it beyond a particular political analysis. I'm talking just a general situational awareness. And these guys are actually saying that, no, the history, the context, it's it really doesn't matter. And what matters is just some sort of bridge between your kind of like innate prejudices and then like, quote unquote, science. And then all of a sudden right. it's like, right. Why? Yeah. Well, right. Why should I work with? Yeah. Them? Why should I do that? Because it's like, of course, it's just a self-reinforcing prejudice loop. Right, right. And, and, you know, I mean, back to the, like, the, Iran, like the, 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 the Muslim point, I mean, if you understand that history, like the Iranian revolution, it was horrible. That was the first Muslim takeover of a country and uh, ended very poorly. And then we're still facing the repercussions. But like anyone who knows Iran understands that the seeds for that revolution were planted in 1953 when the American CIA oust um, Mossadegh, our democratically right. elected leader, from the American embassy. So when the, the Islamic, you know, crazy people take over that embassy and take those Americans hostage, I'm not justifying it, but like everyone in Iran, as appalled as, as we were, understood, oh, they're worried about the Americans because that's where the last coup came from, the fake coup, so we're gonna go there. And so ISIS, I mean, look at every history of ISIS. How did ISIS form? Well, in turns out in Iraqi, um, prisons that we set up and, and uh, mistreated people, you know, so, so, so you look at radical uh, Islam and, 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 and so when Sam Harris says, well, the West has been the only good influence on Islam, and you're like, are you kidding me? You know, like every bad turn 
you know, you can explain by some sort of Western influence. Not every. I mean, obviously, there is plenty of corruption and plenty of deceit to go around all through the Middle East and awful fundamentalism, as there is everywhere, right? Um, however, I think to, to just say, and, and, and like you said, you know, these people have some understanding of knowledge. So I keep hearing, well, Sam Harris is a PhD in neuroscience. Well, like, uh, fine, then let him stick that to one. that. You know? Question that <laughs> right. one. I would question right. that Right, let him stick to that. Right, sure. But, like, you know, <laughs> even Steven Pinker, right? Steven Pinker maybe understands a bit about language, but then he goes off and talks about a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's like, well, maybe this is not your expertise, you know? Um, and so to have a little bit of intellectual humility, um, uh, you know, especially when saying things that, again, like are um, so boring and so old and have destroyed so many lives, you know? Right, um, right. How boring they yeah. are is only matched by how harmful they are. Right, yeah, right. right. Um, yeah, like the, the Charles Murray, yeah, research, quote unquote research. So harmful. Well, I mean, Charles so Murray is another person that you could put in the context of your quotes earlier about Greenspan and Friedman. I mean, Charles Murray has literally right. said in the context of defi- of defending his d- just despicable uh, work on IQ, which actually is really a fundamental. I mean, it's really a fundamental justification. It's not only racist. It's really fundamentally a class hierarchy argument. But, you know, he said by specifically with regards to civil rights, he said, well, you know, by the early 70s, you took most of the juice out of the environment, by which he meant mm-hmm. that literally discrimination wasn't legally codified for the first time in America since Reconstruction. And that, right, oh, right, you know, right. there's yeah, I mean, so it, it's just so ludicrous yeah. and any kind of. And yeah. And to hear Sam Harris talk about it, it's like, well, we just want to hear these ideas. Well, you know who heard Charles Murray's idea is every policymaker right. that he talked to. Like, his ideas have had plenty of podium, right? No one is silencing Charles Murray, you know? And this, is, right. this was a funny thing. Like, I, I don't do Twitter all that well, but I was on Twitter and having these exchanges with, I, you know, should not have poked this bear, but uh, um, the Sam Harris people, yes. and they were like, why are you trying to silence Coleman Hughes? I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I have, like, maybe, like, I don't know, 500 followers or something. This kid has, like, I don't know, 30,000? Like, no one is silencing him. He got retweeted by Sam Harris and Charles Murray and Christine Somers, and and I am retweeted by, you know, like, a bunch of socialists. Right? <laughs> so, like, I, you. you know, like, look at our Some of us are pretty right? influential, have, Marissa. Well, thank you, yeah. yes. You know, but, like, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I... I uh, the, the people who complain most about silencing end up having like the biggest microphones. You know? Oh, it's just jujitsu whining. But I do, I do, I do <laughs> just want to make clear on my end that, uh, uh, and and unlike uh, Marissa, I do want to silence Coleman use among any number of people. <laughs> I'm a silencer. Uh, Marissa Baradaran, the yeah. book is the color of money. Uh, really, honestly, please, people, uh, I know many of you who watch the show have actually told me that they ordered your book um, and have been engaging in your work. This is the type of work that actually explains the world we're in and how to get out of our predicament, and it is actually interesting. So I really appreciate your time, and I hope to have you on again soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Of course. All right, folks. Um, Speaking of silencing, do we have, by the way, do we have that new Gulag song? Oh, yeah, we do. I also came up with an uh, impromptu game about Trump's tweets. If oh, I love it. That. Let's get to maybe we'll do the game on Trump's tweets in the in the post game. The post games, guys, are we're switching it up because I want more sort of showtime where it's 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 the core. Uh, but let's try. This is William Lee. If you have it ready, my friend William Lee, very talented musician, talent manager. He's in Atlanta and he has a gulag song, which I have to admit. I heard this and I thought to myself, I really swear too much, but it's a good beat. Let's uh, let's check Sentence it out. Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. Motherfucking gulag. <laughs> Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. <laughs> motherfucking gulag. <laughs> Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. <laughs> motherfucking gulag. <laughs> Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. <laughs> motherfucking gulag. Get the fuck out of here, massive asshole. <laughs> ma- ma- massive asshole. Massive asshole. <laughs> Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. <laughs> ma- 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 massive asshole. Massive asshole. 
fucking asshole. The asshole. Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. Get the fuck out of here. Motherfucking gulag. Motherfucking gulag. Motherfucking gulag. Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. Motherfucking gulag. Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. Motherfucking gulag. Sentence to the motherfucking gulag. Get the fuck out of here. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I think there's a smoothness to that that actually captures a lot of the TMBS well, zone. It's, it's interesting that he went through and found all the times you swore, but in that particular sort of down tempo way, like fucking right. asshole. Like, right. No, he got it's not he like got what a the fucking asshole. Not like not like, and they are the fucking enemy. It was kind of like Psh, get the fuck out of here. And actually, I do think for tonight's segment. This is a little bit more of a like, oh my god, this person's just a waste of space. Let's give me hit me a little bit of Soviet music for her because I think it would really freak her out if her uh, airhead self ever came across this show. It is time for the Gulag, and by the way, just to let everybody know as a style guide, we're not like attached. It was the pyramid. Now it's the Gulag. It might change up on you. It might be re-education camp. It next. might be re-education camp next. You don't know. The point really is, is to highlight a piece of human trash who deserves public ridicule, shame, and actually, yes, at some point, hopefully a gulag. And also play Orwellian word games with fraught terminology. Precisely. Always say yes to improv, everybody. Uh, today's gulag it comes courtesy of this great clip from The View, which made me realize two things. I can actually even dislike Meghan McCain more than I already did, which is truly awe-inspiring. To anybody uh, who ever had any defense about trust fund babies and or nepotism, I rest my case. And Joy Behar is fucking cool. Let's watch this out. She is a classic, classic case. We were talking about this before. Of exactly how you can slide a solid old line liberal into a good democratic socialist line. This is on The View. Check it out. Or like, isn't democratic socialism very close to liberalism? I mean, no. no. I mean, well, think about it for a second. Medicare, Social Security, uh, well, garbage that's... collection, the post office, but the that's... library. I agree with you. I... That's all well, I agree with you because we, we had her on First the show and I asked her this question about what do you mean by being a democratic socialist? And she went over her platform. She says Medicare for all. Good. Uh, fully funded public schools and universities. Love it. Paid family and sick leave. <laughs> Good. Justice system reform, immigration justice, yeah. infrastructural overhaul, clean campaign finance, an economy of peace, housing as a human right. Well, I don't know. It's a really well, successful well, country. I, can I please push back on wrong with that? This makes my head explode, which, by the way, I hope Democrats do run a democratic socialist. Do you hope that just, we win? Do you win? Do you uh, the Democrats no, because I think you'll lose spectacularly, and then I will look forward to election night when I finally get to tell everybody I told you so if you end up running a radical. Problem with socialism, in the words of Margaret Thatcher, at a certain point you run out of spending other people's money. Venezuela, one of the richest Venezuela. countries in the world in the 70s. Sorry, I just wanted to pause it there. Imagine going on that kind of a roll. And then the citation you make is Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, Margaret Thatcher. It's like she just did every like. I, I hate to actually. I'll do one of those like twerp Harris lines, but like steel man, your opponent. <laughs> like a random like Thatcher quote, and then like an underdeveloped country, which through a combination of like mass U.S. interference, right wing oligarchic counter reaction and internal failings of its own government when like you might if Meghan McCain wasn't totally stupid which already we've canceled out our thought experiment here she would go for like the and even in Sweden the models breaking down but you know she's a fucking and to idiot. sit here and cite 70s Venezuela as like some kind of like ideal situation oh and yeah it's like the glory days of Venezuela the 70s where the, the majority of people were writhing in poverty oh, well, the, the 90s and actually what's funny is you could say you're right in uh, 2003 like during the Chavez years in the commodity boom Venezuela was cutting poverty and hunger. You're absolutely right about that. So I guess the answer is somehow deal with a sustainable model for social investment. Thank you, Megan, you fucking idiot. 
Now, the average Venezuelan has lost 24 pounds because they're starving to death. 90% of the country is living in poverty. I think, like I think she's talking more about Scandinavia than Venezuela. I, but I'm sorry. I need. This is what I need from her. Name one country that socialism has ever worked, and also every Sweden. every democratic socialist Copenhagen, who is going um, on TV Denmark, saying that it's good Norway, needs to start paying 90% in taxes. Iceland. On your tax form. <laughs> no, on your tax. Jesus, she's so stupid. Needs to start paying 90% in taxes. Like because, well, 90, I guess, you know what? Here's yeah. the thing. Here's the th Yeah, maybe so. But here's the thing that's so, like, again, also, and I'm, and I'm, I'm so confident she doesn't even know this because she's really, 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 really stupid. When someone like Bernie Sanders talks about a 90% rate, it's after a certain level of income. So, a vast majority of the population that, say, earn under, say, a million dollars a year or $500,000 a year, they're not going to get that 90% rate. And even the people who would get that 90% rate, it wouldn't be on that first several hundred thousand. So, like, even that point is fucking dumb. And if she had, and, and, and real, the real point is, is like, useless parasites like you are going to actually pay some of your trust fund so people have health care, you stupid, fucking, selfish moron. Yeah. Well, that's the point, right? It's like when they talk about taxes being raised, I would be furious if my taxes were being raised to fund, you know, the U.S. military yes. and all these, like, you know, of decrepit course. social programs that, you know, we have in the U.S. Which are, which I'm going to volunteer I would 90% wanna... of my taxes to subsidize giving this idiot a tax cut? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get the fuck so out I of would, here. We would all be willing to pay more taxes but you're getting all these other things and that's what they always leave out they're like whoa would you want to pay more taxes it's like no shit nobody wants to pay more taxes especially for what we're getting now and yeah. by the way nobody under I, I, like if you live in new york city you shouldn't pay any taxes unless you make at least seven hundred thousand dollars a year definitely like i and i'm not joking a hundred percent this is purely about taking back wealth that the class that this idiot represents have stolen and have blood clotted for themselves so that someone like this could go through life without even just the thought of like, you know what? Maybe I'm a selfish buffoon who's had everything handed to me, but maybe just there's 1% that's like, I'd like to at least plan on the contingency of not making a complete jackass of myself on national television. Yeah, Megan, you are the embodiment of a decadence of uh, a sort of free ride economically. You're Habsburg <laughs> with less economic... You're exactly... She's Habsburg with less language skills. Like. <laughs> Unless, like, access to cool real estate, imagine. <laughs> Megan McCain. Oh, my God. Is there more of this? Is she still tantruming? We can go as long as we feel. No, you know what? We don't need to go okay, anymore. Yeah. Megan McCain needs to go to the gulag. She's a useless waste of space, and she needs spiritual, intellectual, and material. Uh, she, she, she is the type of person that makes one want to do a revisionist reading of Mao. <laughs> and with that said, let's get to a segment that makes Dr. Richard Wolff say on site every time he hears it. This is the, uh, Matt always likes to pick the- The, f the, the opening the, one has that guy talking about it. opening one has it. Uh, we do a regular segment now. Some other left shows might be focused on, I don't know, the latest Twitter beef, something like that. We deal with the nitty gritty of economics because we want to give you the best news information and insight available and also because David Griscom, who I support, who I've brought onto my show. Griscom. 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 David Griscom uh, has an Oedipal fixation on Richard Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> I packed my yeah. bags from DC, moved to New York with one goal in mind <laughs> You're just to like, become the king of left wing. That's right. You're like, I'm <laughs> taking over Mark's podcast. podcasting, Bob. First, it's going to start as an internship. Then it's going to start as a recurring segment. And before you know it, I'll have my own vehicle, and that old son of a bitch won't know what hit him. All right, David, go ahead. Yeah, um, so after scouring through the you know financial press for the last week, uh, the main story for the week has been um, um, the flattening yield curve, um, which is approaching an inversion. 
Um, so just for a little context, we understand what that means. Uh, an inverted yield curve has preceded every recession since 1956, which is why people are quite worried about it. Um, what the inverted yield curve means is uh, whenever their short term rates exceed long term rates, meaning that if you invest money, you know, in the short term, you're going to get more return than in the long term, which basically implies a kind of like shaky feeling about the economy. It has lots of different effects that go throughout. Um, and but mainly the question is like whether or not this is the cause of recession or not. But I'm not really interested in going into that because there's a lot of political un and economic uncertainty about the current uh, uh, yield rates. Um, you have to understand like Trump is pretty wild and a lot of people don't really understand what's going on. The Federal Reserve has been pretty bullish on saying that they're going to just pull through as if everything is normal, even though economically it's not. There's still sluggish growth in the EU and China is now experimenting with new monetary policies um, that could have like pretty interesting um, effects across the US. But here's what I'm worried about. When we're talking about yield curves and the possibility of another recession, everyone's talking about, well, the economy is healthy. The economy is healthy. We've had this great recovery. And I look at it and I just start to worry and wonder, as we've talked about a lot on this show, what kind of recovery have we had? Right. As we've talked a lot, um, wages have been so stagnant for so long. You know, the hourly wage for people in the 25th uh, percentile was uh, $12.25, $12.25 in March 2017. And it's only up around 2% from a year earlier, meaning that it's barely even kept up with inflation. So the point is, is that we've had this recovery. Where's all this you know, money been coming from? And where's Actually, it going? The, well, the largest, right. the largest boost in the economy has been consumer spending from the bottom 40%. Wait a second. We're talking about a bunch of people who aren't making any money. Well, how are they paying for all these consumer goods? How are they becoming a larger purchasing power in the U.S. economy? Well, I have an answer for you. Debt. And this is the problem with capitalism is whenever it comes across its natural limits or its tensions or its contradictions, mainly the contradiction between uh, labor and capital, it just tries to move the problem around. Um, so when we're looking at the debt rates, um, the, the household debt rates for the working class, I've been coming across some very frightening numbers, much more frightening than a kind of speculative number that we're seeing with the um, yield curves. Um, so let's just talk about this for one second. Credit card and auto loan delinquencies in the past year um, are on the rise, and savings uh, um, have plummeted to their lowest since 2005. The amount of uh, non-housing consumer debt um, to disposable income just crossed over around 25% over the past five years. So we're talking about people paying around 25% of their income on loan payments. Now, loans and the interest rates that people pay on their loans have been rather low for the past five, six years. Why? As we've talked about in other economic updates, interest rates have been historically low, basically to pump money into the economy. So what we now have is an already unsustainable debt load on the working class, a debt load which is going now to feed um, the pockets of the wealthiest in our society. Um, that is so unsustainable that it's going to be rocked, one, by the already naturally occurring interest rate hikes, and two, by any kind of external shock. And when we're seeing you know, the financial class get worried about the state of the economy, um, and then we look at the actual economy that is what working class people are experiencing and how sick that it is, I don't know what people are talking about when they're talking about a healthy economy. I don't know about a healthy economy where people are having to work two jobs. I don't know about a healthy economy where we have to crowdsource payments for people to pay for their medical bills. I don't know um, uh, uh, about a healthy economy where people are spending 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of their income on rent. So right. I'm I mean, I don't know. I don't have good news Do you on think this. That, that the other the other thing that I could see, which is also which is frankly, e I mean, equally as disturbing is, um, you know, uh, short of a meltdown, you know, another economic catastrophe, which I mean, Jesus Christ, under Trump, that prospect is just <laughs> I don't even want to entertain that. But uh, a recession it would seem to me that the way that the geography and the stratification of wealth and the structures of those capital flows is already such that like people who are already incredibly harmed and hurt structurally will be even worse off and even more undermined, especially in terms of like the slight, you know, the labor market getting better, or even some of these like tiny green shoots for people who actually aren't wealthy. And then, you know, it will have no like, Wealth and distribution is already so hoarded that if it's a mild recession, it will just sort of like reinforce the structural realities that we're already in every day. 
Well, I mean, ex- yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, I wrote a piece on this uh, called Financial Discontents, which you can read on uh, WeStandUp.org. Um, and it's basically, you know, one of the things about recessions that doesn't get talked about enough is that recessions really overwhelmingly harm working people and, and the working class right. because these are people who don't have any savings. So when money becomes tight and because we've created a society, because the capitalist class has basically repressed wages for so long and degraded the power of labor unions through, uh, you know, their, their ability to influence uh, the U.S. government and the legal system, that we basically have a working class that hasn't been able to push up for wage gains that are desperately needed, that they've had to rely so much on debt. And when these debt that we get from credit cards, from loans, from housing payments, um, you know, from housing loans, from car loans and things like that, when that market starts to dry up, when that market starts to become really unaffordable for the working class, that's when you start to see these really bad recessions because these people are, you know, most people aren't able to pay for the goods that they need to survive. We, d- we already aren't able to pay for the goods that we need to survive. Right. That's basically the point. And whenever these, the debt mechanism, which is already a fake and a dangerous game that the U.S. Uh, economy has been playing for a few decades now, when that dries up, I mean, it really plunges people into quite desperate situations, which is just why, you know, this is why, you know, the political struggle that we're in today, the reason that people are so motivated, I think, is because people really feel this tension. They yes. feel this this issue. Definitely. And we can't ignore it anymore. And I think, you know, 2008, 2009 was a real wake up call. And you remember, that was a crisis that was caused by these debt um, industries that That's were right. coming us, which were very profitable for the folks who were on top. Right. You know, they were trading them. And, uh, you know, so it's like we need to think we need to be strategic. But look, we can't wait. I mean, we can't you know, sort of wait and just sort of play election cycle by election cycle. I mean, we need strategies now to prepare ourselves because we are in a situation that is looking quite dire. So you move on all fronts at once. There's no doubt about that. Um, I'm getting a little bit of a message here. It's from Richard Wolf. <laughs> he says that little prick is kind of clever. A minus clever, not a plus. If I ever catch him east of 14th or above 56th in general, on site, toodaloo in solidarity, Richard Wolf. So I have dinner plans this weekend. I'm going to need some help. Well, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. There's a lot of things I can protect you from. I mean, look, if it's like pure podcasts, I've got your back, no problem. But I can't do anything about you. If you want to mess with Wolf, I'm taking enough of a risk by giving you a platform for this, okay? <laughs> you hear a car idling outside your apartment, you know who it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, like <laughs> David's like, I think I want to get and do a natty ice run, just stay in and read Gropshi tonight. Oh, no! no! <laughs> <laughs> He's just clipped on the street. You know, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read the Marxist archive tonight. Maybe just drink some cores. <laughs> oh no! Shiner box, please. <laughs> Heard you've been talking about me. <laughs> Heard you got a lot of ideas about recession and Amazon strikes. You think strikes. you know Brooklyn? <laughs> you think you know Brooklyn? You think you know <laughs> surplus value? <laughs> I'll show you a surplus. Right here. <laughs> wow. What do you do with labor value when it's floating in the fucking <laughs> Gowanus Canal? <laughs> like, Mr. Wolf, please, I'll stop the economic updates. <laughs> you had your chance to act in mutual aid before. <laughs> now you're going to get clipped. <laughs> Solidarity, never. <laughs> Solidarity for me, not for thee. All right. It's some assistant. It's like, all right, take care of this fucking piece of trash for me. I can go do a talk at CUNY. <laughs> all right, one more. We're going to do one more segment here in the main show, and then we're going to go to the post game. Um, there's a lot of people who are very worried about what's happening with Russia, one way or another. I've said this many times i'm somewhere in the middle of this issue i think that there is a xenophobia and fear-mongering about russia which i vehemently oppose i on a policy level certainly want as much of a de-escalation as possible in terms of a bilateral relationship between the united states and russia and to the extent to which there's a policy upshot things like 
I mean, and this sounds frankly just utopian, but the reality would be multilateral agreements on things like cybersecurity and setting new frameworks uh, that would really restrain all of these countries from just, uh, you know, massively violating each other's cyber uh, economies and cyber politics on a daily basis. We do it. China does it. Russia does it. It's a part of global affairs. Uh, and it's uh, potentially a very big problem. And it also, uh, in, in you know, different cases, is also a symptom of uh, real abuse. Uh, and if we look at, you know, Edward Snowden's revelations with things like, you know, obviously NSA surveillance of, uh, you know, civilians and citizens in this country and outside of it, but also uh, uh, some of the hostility and aggressiveness towards even the Dilma Rousseff government, we could still f see fed into... Uh, the crisis, the lawfare coup in Brazil that we've been focusing on so much today. On the other hand, I think people uh, have a, some people have an, uh, an odd sort of, I don't know if it's a sympathy for Russia, but I think they sort of undersell Russia's own imperial games and own sort of co-generation of problems. And I see no need to sort of indulge that perspective. And I'm down with using some of the things around this issue to whack Trump. I think there's a third way there. Uh, I didn't agree with Ryan Cooper's piece entirely, and I didn't agree with Corey Robbins' response entirely in the sort of lingo of this left conversation. But why across the board, it, there could be an invasion of Iran. That is a war that is very real possibility. And that is an area where the overwhelming policy consensus of Washington mandarins has been aggressive, illegal, raw, uh, uh, complicit, by the way, across the board, from Rudy Giuliani to Howard Dean in supporting a group called the MEK, which is a literal terrorist cult. A death cult. A death cult that fought on with Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s and is hated across every political board in Iran you can imagine. And major U.S. policymakers and think tankers and those types of people across the political spectrum have supported the MEK. It's disgusting. It's a moral calumny. And there is a zero appetite amongst any faction in Iranian politics on the grounds or otherwise for the MEK. So there isn't even a colonial vehicle, frankly, to take over Iran. And if you're interested in supporting organic uprisings in Iran, whether they be labor because of Iran's incredible economic inequality, whether they be women's activists, whether they be people uh, working for the rights of everything from Baha'is and women specifically to civil assembly and uh, uh, you know civil rights broadly, any U.S. official backing those protests will reinforce all of the talking points of the regime that any uprising is merely a CIA instrument. And here is Ari Fleischer, uh, when you're ready, because this clip really distills everything wrong right now. This is a guy who helped propagandize and sell the Bush administration's lies, which led to its catastrophic invasion of Iraq, which is responsible conservatively for several hundred thousand deaths and quite likely could be over a million, not to mention millions of displaced and a crisis that continues to this day. Here he is propagandizing now on behalf of uh, aggressive moves towards Iran. The level of corruption and wealth among Iranian leaders shows you? that Iran is Sorry. run by... This clip begins with Mike Pompeo describing the United States. Oh, wait, no, he's talking about Iran. Corruption wealth among Iranian leaders shows that Iran is run by something that resembles the mafia more than a government. What did you make of that comparison? I welcomed it. It was Ronald Reagan-like. And you know what? Iran is going through turmoil in its streets and its cities right now and has been for months. And it's a leaderless rebellion that's taking place because there's such a dissatisfaction throughout the Iranian society with its government. And Mike Pompeo put his finger on one of the biggest problems, and it's corruption. The people want their basic needs. They want their food. They want their health care. They want their environment. And the Iranian government is so corrupt, it's making it much harder for people to live in that country. So 
fascinating change is underway inside Iran. No one can predict where they're going to go. But the more unstable we can help Iran to become, mm. the better it is to actually secure peace if we can get rid of that theological regime one day or if the Iranian people can get rid of it themselves. So it's interesting. So he just delegitimized organic movements in Iran, which is the exact instrument and desire of people inside the Iranian government that want no change, and then threatens and spoke on behalf of U.S. regime change activities, which could be short of North Korean military conflict, potentially the most catastrophic thing that could realistically happen in the world today. So I would suggest that people get a lot more focused on averting this. And I mean that across the board from assembling yourselves against the Republican war machine and also, and this is not political point scoring. I don't care about that. But when there was a sanctions package, which was primarily presented as a Russia sanctions package, and this is a great example of where I stand. I don't care about micro-targeted sanctions against Russia, to be perfectly blunt with you. I'm totally agnostic on them. I don't know how I would vote against on them. But they were part of a package that also that, that put sanctions on Iran, and this was before Bush destroy, uh, Trump destroyed that deal. Every single member of the Democratic caucus voted for that sanctions package except for Bernie Sanders. And you should let all of these people know, particularly presidential contenders, that just as they needed to move in the right direction on Medicare for all and a federal jobs guarantee and a postal banking option, and you thank them for it and you appreciate their work, there is no bullshit about Iran. If you want to frame it from a democratic perspective, how could you not be fighting to the hilt to protect President Obama's signature foreign policy accomplishment, the greatest diplomatic breakthrough of modern American diplomacy? And, and, and beyond that, you better tell them that I don't care what the Israel angle is. I don't care what kind of goal for Israel or Emirates connections you have or what you feel or just the lazy cliche or arms industry for that matter or just the lazy cliche of demonizing iran if you give an inch on facilitating every anything from even worse tensions and 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 instigation to god forbid invasion you will take that note that's a foreign policy uh red line period and we need to get serious about that and spend a hell of a lot more energy on that because that truly could be uh, catastrophic and fits with a obscene U.S. foreign policy that, of course, as Marison mentioned before, uh, you know, very important moments like the CIA engineered coup of uh, Mossadegh in 1953. So I just wanted to, to put that on the table. It's very, very important to get Iran in the center of the conversation now. I think that's I'm really glad that we're bringing this up. I think it's something that a lot of folks on the left really need to um, be focusing more on. I mean, you know, the, the sanctions regime in general in Iran has been absolutely devastating. Yes. And the folks that are really hurt, you know, oftentimes are, you know, working people um, in Iran. And, and the things that they are unavailable to folks there, I mean, from even, um, you know, parts for airplanes. I mean, we saw, you know, a crash earlier this year. And this is because. Um, you know, there are things that are just unavailable to people because the United States... It's a very States unsafe... I just want to elaborate. Iran's plane industry is structurally unsound and unsafe to a very rare degree in the modern world because they have not been able to upgrade their fleets because of sanctions. Correct? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yes. And it's like, the thing is, like, you know, sanctions, uh, I know there, I know a lot of liberals are big fans of them, but I find them to be incredibly violent. And oftentimes they really hurt uh, people who are already suffering. I mean, we're, t you know, looking at Iran. We're also looking at, you know, U.S. actions in, in Venezuela, too. And, you know, oftentimes these History sanctions regimes... Cuba. Like, yeah, of course, you know. Yeah. And it's like, you know, people talk about, it's like, oh, this is a nonviolent way of enacting pressure. We have to understand that the United States over the past, you know, 100 years, uh, you know, 50 years or so has just completely dominated the global economy and the amount of power it has as the wor world uh, reserve currency to be able to strangle um, entire nations um, from international trade and from even being able to have normal relations with other country. It's incredibly damaging. And you don't create actual conditions, in my opinion, that are favorable to changing a regime that we might not particularly like. All that you do is you make people suffer, but you also in, instill a kind of 
um, you know, a grit against the U.S. who is so obviously engaging in a kind of financial war against you. I mean, like that's and it's so it's just so absolutely clear. And just one more point, you know, on the MEK, it's one of these incredible ironies of history. You know, the MEK gives so much money. Um, to these politicians yep. and to these figures, they they pay people fifteen twenty thousand dollars to come and speak at their rallies. All these folks don't even know what the MEK is in the first place. Right, and it's important that we become educated on these things. Look, you know, I, I mean, when I look at the you know the Islamic Republic in Iran, you know, it makes me very frustrated. It makes me sad. I know so many incredible Iranians. I know how much damage. Um, that the Islamic Republic has has done. At the same time, I also understand the conditions that the Islamic Republic was able to come into power. And that was because not only, let's remember this, not only did the United States um, destroy a democratically elected government in Iran. Then it backed the Shah for decades. Well, let's not, but let's not forget the material reasons why. And the British who were worried about losing the Iranian oil fields. Mossadegh was going to nat- nationalize He was going to nationalize them. And, they, the and there's a really great yeah. piece on the um, LRB. I'll tweet it out later. I can't remember the title right now. Um, about how British intelligence was basically able to uh, influence the United States' red, you know, fears of communist revolution to just get the entire um, security apparatus in the United States into an uproar, feeling that they needed to take down a fairly moderate, you know, social democratic politician um, oh, in definitely. Iran. And well, you know, Mossadegh was a was a was very much in the very analogous actually to Allende. Yeah. Um, and also, I would just say that the the rhetoric that sanctions are nonviolent reflects the broader delusion that economics is not a form of violence. You know, depriving people of foods, jobs, uh, uh, you know, uh, flying securely, that's violence. Violence is not just the literalized you know, act of violence. All of this is violence. Uh, it's violence to cut food stamps. It's violence to take away people's health care. This is all violence. And when we understand that properly, the proper analysis and the proper economics, then you can't throw those terms around uh, so lightly. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the post game. We have calls. We have clips. We have an interesting Trump tweet game that Matt has designed for us, plus your Discord questions and a whole lot more. Um, Follow all of us. We're tweeting out the new YouTube channel. As soon as you get it, subscribe to it uh, and start sharing those videos because that's going to be the next wave of the ever-expanding TMBS universe. Our numbers grow every day, and YouTube is going to be a significant part of that. Uh, and become a patron. It's really important. You get way more content. You sustain all of us um, and allow us to, you know, be secure, have a living. That's essential. Um, and it's uh, it's it's really important. And you really get two to three times more of the content. Woke Bros with Waz and I is regular. You get the post games to participate in them. And also, in addition to the comedy and the audience engagement, we're taking on different issues in the post game. And this post game is an example. We're dealing with um, some of the uh, China Belt Initiative in Africa, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Also, um, uh, a a candidate, a populist candidate out of West Virginia. Uh, And then, of course, the illicit histories and primers, everything from history of U.S.-Iran relationships to the how-tos of organizing in today's world. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Join. Spread the word. We're committed to this mission. Thanks for being with us on it. Thank you, Super Producer Matt Leck, Chief Economist David Griscom, Super Producer David Slavic, Intern James, YouTube Maestro Forrest. We will see you on the postgame.